Welcome to Nature Therapy Online. Hi folks and welcome to episode 13 of Nature Therapy Online. In this episode, I've got a really interesting interview lined up for you with Andy McGinney, the author of With Nature in Mind, which is a really interesting and um, a really useful book for ecotherapists and mental health professionals. But this interview, um, I think, is of interest to anybody who's interested in working in nature. So I really hope you enjoy the interview. Um, I really enjoyed catching up with Andy and doing this. Uh, it was He's such a great guy. Um, really friendly and 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 he has so much experience and so many great ideas as i think you will uh, agree so um yeah without further ado here is the interview hi folks so i'm here with andy mcgini who's a leading voice in the ecotherapy world in the uk and he's the author of the incredible book with nature in mind um which is one of the first ecotherapy books I ever picked up and it's um, it's a great manual and offers so many ideas uh, for working with people when you're an ecotherapist. So um, so I was really delighted when Andy agreed to uh, be interviewed for the podcast. So thank you very much, Andy, and hello. Hi, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Um, um, I'm hoping it's going to be an interesting conversation where maybe I'll clarify some of my thinking. Well, you're really welcome. I'm, I'm delighted that you're here. You know, um, we tried a couple of, for the benefit of the listeners, we tried a few times. Um, we've had some car breakdowns and, you know, I had a diary malfunction. So this is the third time, lucky, we've uh, managed, to get, managed to get the date nailed. So, so I'm quite excited. So, um, I mean, do, would you mind uh, to kick us off, Andy, just um, mm. telling us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do with ecotherapy yeah sure sure um well it kind of goes back a long way really um you know as far as i can remember i've always had a deep connection to nature um i think if you look in the front of my book i talk about walks with my grandfather um Mm. when i was well just two and three and and just feeling totally captivated and it's, I think it's that sense of fascination, that sense of absorption, that sense of wonder, um, the tranquility and the peace, but also the kind of excitement when you see something new for the first time. I think I had that all the way through my childhood. And I, <laughs> I got to a stage in my teens where I realized, actually, maybe this isn't a cool thing, you know, (laughs) to be so interested in nature and wildlife. But I kind of stuck with it. Um, And I think in my teens at the same time, I also got an interest in in notions of the mind and so on. And I thought, well, maybe if I go to university and study animal behaviour, there might be some kind of job in that. Mm. So that was my original thought, that maybe I could, I could be somebody who studies animal behavior. But the kind of things change at university and so on. And I kind of stuck with the psychology from a professional point of view. And that was my day job, if you like, which I, I've thoroughly enjoyed. And the natural history side, my, that passion there was something I, I, I kept from kind of outside time. Mm. Um, and it was probably 30 years ago that I started to try and merge these two parts of myself. And when that started to happen, I kind of, something happened in my, myself. And I thought, yeah, this is it. This is what I should be doing. This is, mm. this is an amazing combination. This combination of my professional background in um, counseling and psychology and my, this personal passion for, for being connected to nature. Mm. Um, mm. Well, where, where do we, where, how far do you want to take this, really? Um, uh, I, I had lots of opportunities to kind of experience uh, working with people because that was the other thing. I, I think probably the side of me that was interested in psychology, which meant I was interested in people, 
and I was particularly interested in group work. So a lot of my professional life has been working with teams of people and groups. Um, when I was working freelance, I did a lot of work in organizations with groups that weren't getting on with each other, where there was a lot of conflict. And I would come in a bit like the Lone Ranger as an outside facilitator mm -hmm. and try to work out what the dynamics were and try to help people really sort mm -hmm. out their own groups. So I think I, I had all this experience before I went on a Joanna Macy deep ecology mm. training week and that just completely blew my mind. You know, I mean, Joanna Macy, she is an amazing woman. Mm. I don't know whether you've come across her, but uh, if you hadn't, check her out. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's someone and, whose name just, uh, you know, when you, you, when you are investigating ecotherapy, uh, it comes up time and time again as, as, as such an inspirational, um, as such an inspirational person. But, but I have to admit, I've, I've not read any of her books as yet, although I've got, I've, I've had my finger just on the buy button this week, almost on the several of her books. So it's funny you should mention Joanna Macy. Yeah. Well, she was really one of the pioneers mm. and her background of being a teacher and of Buddhism. Mm. She was working with people in the anti-nuclear thing way back in the 60s. Mm. And what she discovered was that there were these people that were passionate about getting rid of nuclear weapons. And they knew a lot, a lot more information than other people. And they started to try and communicate this and they got the kind of blank looks or even hostility and she found that these a lot of these people were just burning out mm -hmm. and so she started to work with these people and she started to work with their emotions what what, what were their feelings around this and just to kind of update that in kind of 30 years later she found a similar pattern amongst people who are working in the environmental movement mm -hmm. so i would imagine it, they were the equivalent of what we've got xr now so these are the people who'd kind of woken up and gone, oh my God, you know, things are really serious. You know, ecological systems are collapsing and so on. And they were getting stressed out as well. And um, she worked and developed this area called deep ecology, um, which was really connecting at a deep level, at a spiritual level, an emotional level, a total body level to the natural environment. Um, and it was, it was a revelation because I think I mentioned earlier that as a teenager, I kind of kept quiet about the fact that I was so interested in nature. I kind of waited for somebody else to do it. And when I went on the Joanna Macy workshop, I said, you know what, this is a bit like hearing my gay friends when they said they came out. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm coming out because mm -hmm. I'm with this group of 40 people who get what Joanna's about, and I get it. Um, it sounds like such a powerful experience, and you know, and I, you know, even when you were saying then that you know, thirty years ago, you you know, you you decided that this was what you needed to do to bring your you know your work working with people's mental health together with your love of nature. That strikes me as really radical actually you know I, I think i mean to be honest i think it's it, it it's you know sadly still radical now even though for for me it just seems like the most obvious thing well of course we feel better when we're outdoors mm. and and amongst you know other beings and in nature but you know for a lot of people i guess listening to this you know uh, the concept of ecotherapy and nature therapy is 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 quite new even now so um I just wanted to reflect on that and say, I think that that's like really incredible and, and that, you know, that you were, you know, getting into this kind of work 30 years ago. Um, I think it's great. I think, I think what happened to me was what happens to a lot of people. They grow up, <laughs> they find a job that they can manage or in the best cases really turns them on. They maybe start a family or they get deeper relationships and that's through the 30s and maybe in their 40s they go yeah is there anything else or what is is this what life maybe not even being dissatisfied but just asking deeper questions 
Mm-hmm. And that is about um, finding, I think, what your true nature is. And I know that sounds a bit kind of flaky, but um, for me, I discovered there was a congruence. There was an alignment between my professional background in psychology and my deep interest in nature. Mm-hmm. And the Joanna Macy experience of deep ecology kind of gave me a way forward, Mm -hmm. which meant I could really be myself. That I'd found a means, a way of being myself and expressing that and sharing that, that was effortless. Mm -hmm. And that is incredibly powerful when that happens to anybody. Mm -hmm. Some people find it through music or dance or acting, you know, they're, they're the kind of, more often occurs in the arts, because you, you talk to people in the arts and they, they had this early passion, I don't know, to go on the stage or something, and, and when they come alive when they're on the stage. Mm. Um, something like that happened to me, and I realized be, that I had the facility to share that with other people, and I think one of my roles is to actually seduce people into get connecting to nature. Mm. I'm the I'm the the medium, the facilitator, the enabler. I'm not the important bit, really. It's the person when I'm out with a group. It's the people that are in the out and nature itself that is the relationship that's that's key. That's amazing, and it's it's so um, uh, powerful the way you talk about it, especially as you know it. Um, you know, it's something that's been present throughout your life as this common thread you know it, it feels almost like you know there, there were there were times when um you know you you felt more able to be open about it with people than others but that that thread has always been there and you know i, th- I think you know to um to come through a, a period where you didn't feel you were able to actually you know as a teenage a teenage boy i mean it, it yeah i mean it's hard i imagine that's really hard to say to people you know i i love being out with the trees and um, and spending time with the birds you know like you know yeah. you, you know and you know the ones that fly you know so uh, but, and it, it's you know just to you know i think uh, uh, so um inspiring that you were true to yourself and you know like and this this book i think um uh, that you that you wrote with nature in mind and um, that's the title of the book for the listeners it's called with nature in mind and and it does just that you know i I've, i mean certainly for for me you know when i started to um train as an ecotherapist and started doing my first groups this book was so um just so handy and so helpful you know and it, and it's mm. you, you have a way of writing that um is is really really clear and it's non threatening you know it, it make it made me feel like oh i can do this because it's almost like nature has got my back and so I, it was really inspiring in that way i didn't i you see that's because the book came out of the work i didn't just wake up one morning and go you know what i I really like nature i'm going to write a book about it Mm -hmm. um i ran loads and loads of workshops i I I ran lots of training workshops and what was happening is i was running training workshops for psychologists counselors um, countryside rangers and kind of people like that and and for the general public before uh, uh, um, as well as rather me working with people who had had a, a mental health diagnosis. So I had had all this experience, which I was, I was kind of honing the activities and so on, trying different things out, experimenting. And on the workshops, people would often say, oh, just to go back a bit, I would say at the beginning of a workshop, I don't want anybody to take any notes. I don't want anybody, to, I want you to be fully present here. Mm. You know, so uh, people would say, yeah, I'd really like to be able to remember some of the activities we did. So I started to produce handouts and I produced a, um, a little eco booklet, which I still give out to, to people in workshops, mm. which is instructions on how to do every activity. Mm. And I, my style of training is very much experiential, mm. that you immerse yourself in something that you want to learn about, you experience it, and only then do you start talking about it, abstracting, intellectualizing, um, which was difficult for some people on workshops because they wanted the theory first. They wanted to, so what is ecotherapy? How do you explain it? What's your definition of it? 
Mm. And I absolutely refused that. <laughs> okay. yeah. I didn't want to impose my definition. Mm. I didn't want to say to you, Stephen, ecotherapy is this. Mm. You know, I'm older than you, I'm more experienced, you've got to listen to me. That's crap, that's rubbish. You will have your own connection to nature, your own way in, your own door, and that is what you need to discover. I can help you, but that's, you don't need me to tell you what ecotherapy is because mm. you already have an innate connection to nature. So let's just kind of explore that in more detail. Mm. And so the book evolved out of all of that. And when I sat down to write it, it just flowed out of me because I could remember conversations and um, questions that people had, difficulties. Well, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. So I was able to, I really enjoyed writing the book. I wrote the book, I enjoyed it so much that when I finished it, I thought, you know what, if nobody wants to publish this, I don't, I don't care really. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Mm. Um, I didn't get a publisher before because I didn't want anybody to tell me what to write or how with their idea. I wanted to write my book and then go, look, I've written this. What do you think? Mm. So, uh, and I think, you know, you, you feel, uh, I feel that when I read the book, you know, that it's, that it's from experience and that there is just so much, uh, love and joy in it. You know, it, it doesn't, you know, some, some, sometimes like, you know, when you, I don't know, you, you, you're reading a book, especially about, uh, you know, uh, nature themes, you know, and it feels laborious to read, you know, the, it, it, it yeah, I, I, I sometimes wonder if it was laborious to write as well, you know, and, and I think that, that there's a link there, you know, that you can, I don't know, I can almost sense there's that clarity in, in your book that it, it just feels like, uh, you know, that it does come from, you know, from joy. You could, I could sense that. Right. So it, make, it makes sense to me, you know. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you, you were talking then about, um, about uh, the training that you do. So I'm quite curious about uh, different uh, kinds of work that you're up to at the moment. So could, could you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what kind of um, ecotherapy uh, projects and, and jobs you've got going on at the moment, Andy? Mm. Uh, okay, I need to give you a bit of history. And that is I was working um, as an ecotherapist, actually I was working for the NHS. Mm. Um, and that was round about, round about the time that I decided to write the book, um, my job was abolished. <laughs> because it was the time the Cameron coalition government got in and they decided to, to carry out various cuts in the NHS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the mental health trust I worked for said, well, we're not going to do anything that we don't have a statutory requirement. I, we're not going to do anything unless we have to by yeah, law. Absolutely have to. Yeah. Okay. And Lindsay Ryan, who pioneered the establishment of ecotherapy in Northeast London mental health trust. Um, she had fought for years to establish it and to get, get to get my post, um, there was nothing she could really do. And mm. so I, I stopped working there, but that, that was a prompt for me to, okay, maybe I can, I can now, now I've got the time to write the book. Um, I continued to vol voluntarily work with people who'd had a mental health diagnosis in Dagenham, East London. So I, I ran on Wednesdays, I used to run a, um, a free workshop for people. And I used to run pay, paying, fee paying workshops then. But then I got to a certain point and I thought, um, actually, I want to be in um, a countryside that is more accessible, that is, that is wilder than where I am. So at the time I was living in Brentwood in Essex which is just a couple of miles outside the M25. So you could, you could sit in the garden, you could hear the M25. Mm. And um, there was, a, at the back of my, where, where I lived, you could go around the garages and into this wood. Mm. And it was fantastic. You could sit there, there were badgers, foxes, and all sorts in there. Mm. So um, the, about two years before I left, I left there, they were built a housing estate on the other side of the wood. And I started to feel kind of hemmed in and I realized uh, if I wanted to go anywhere wild, I had to get in the car. So I just thought, right, 
where would I like to live? And I drew up a list of five places. One of them was Devon. And so I, I moved to Devon for me. I thought, uh, you know, I'll figure out how I do the ecotherapy when I get there. Mm. Um, when I moved here two years ago, which was in October time, two years ago, I just settled in. And then I got a diagnosis in the spring of, of, of bladder cancer, which was a big shock. So last year was really spent me getting tests and diagnosis and beginning the treatment. And I didn't have much energy then. So I didn't really get to explore the area. Mm. Um, but I did start in the beginning of this year. And then of course the COVID thing came. Mm. So everything kind of has shut down. I was on, because of my treatment, um, I was in this especially vulnerable category, told I couldn't leave my house or anything like that. Um, and so all the ecotherapy work has really been put on hold mm. in terms of me working with other people. Mm. I've had various conversations locally, um, the National Trust, uh, Exmoor National Park, people in there are interested and I did have some kind of vague idea that okay when I moved down to Devon I could run workshops and I could run them for local people in Devon but also I could probably uh, encourage people who've been on workshops near London to come down to Devon and maybe perhaps run longer workshops mm. perhaps a kind of weekend or something um, and so what I, would, what I would say is right now I'm not doing any workshops and I'm not offering any. And with the COVID thing, I've got no plans in mind. I mean, it sounds like, you know, the, you know, look, looking after, after your health and, you know, dealing with the situation that we're in is, is like, I guess for a, a lot of people out there is, is your priority and has to be right now. Yeah, although what I would say is the treatment's been going very well. That's great. Um, there's no, no recurrence of the symptoms or anything. I've got my energy back. Excellent. Um, and I'm feeling pretty positive about the whole thing. Mm, you know? that's brilliant. But it's a three-year program, so, so mm. we're not at the end of it yet, <laughs> kind mm. of thing. Um, but yes, I, I have had to look after myself. But I've also been aware that... Um, the ecosystems, the, the nature around it is different from what it is in Essex, from East Anglia. Mm. And it's, well, I mean, for a, for a start, I can go out of my front door and within 15 minutes, I'm standing on the cliff tops looking out across the Bristol Channel wow. to Wales. Mm. Now, it's just that is mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. I can go 20 minutes and I can go down into Lynmouth and I'm by the River Lynn, which is a really wild, fast flowing, rocky river that goes down to the sea in just a space of a few miles. Mm. Uh, I can walk up that, I can go through oak forests, mm. I can go up an open moorland, and these are all different habitats. They've got different plants, it's a lot wetter here, so you've got ferns and mosses, the, the climate is different, the winters are milder. So I'm actually saying to myself, what I need to do is to really deepen my connection to nature. And then, as what happened before, nature will tell me what to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't mean that in any kind of weird way. Mm -hmm. I just mean that all the activities that you read in the book that I came up with, they came up with me experimenting and connecting to nature. And then saying, oh, yeah, this is something I could share with other people. It's like, you and know, you, you tune into your landscape and it, and it reveals itself. Yeah, I don't want to just transpose what I learned in Essex and do the same stuff down here. Mm. And fundamentally, it, because it's me, there'll be a lot that's in common in the methodology and the, the way of being. But what we connect to and how we connect to, I think it's going to be really, it's, it's going to be quite a shift. Mm, mm. It's not as big a shift as if well, I say, well, we're going to do a, a workshop in Morocco or something, yeah, you yeah. know, because that would be a really big step. But nevertheless, the West Country, 
um, is definitely different and being by the coast is definitely different and I'm really excited by it all. Mm. Yeah. It's really yeah. great to hear that and I was re- well something I was really um, curious about um, Andy you know especially with you having such a, a deep relationship with nature when you were um, you know discussing having to I guess spend a lot of time at home and and you know, uh, I guess you were shielding at one point as well. Um, like, how do you, and I guess this ties in, you know, I guess I was going to um, ask you actually, you know, for some little tips for, for listeners. Um, it's something I usually ask the guests who come onto the show. Um, so I wonder if you've got any tips to share, like specifically for, you know, people who might not be able to go outside at times, you know, or, or perhaps if people are, might be, shielding you know or people who maybe have disabilities or struggle to get out for whatever reason do, do you have any kind of ways that you bond with nature um from indoors or where you know or when you were struggling to get outdoors from a window mm-hmm. or anything like that yeah i mean um, maybe i can briefly mention what happened to me i, I was told in march right you are in the exceptionally vulnerable category you must stay in your house so I made all the arrangements for getting food and stuff like that. But then I, my second thought was, there's no way for my physical and mental health, I'm going to stay in my house. Mm-hmm. But I ne- in order to conform to the uh, you know, correct medical advice, I decided to go out at night time. Mm-hmm. I figured that, I mean, the population is pretty low down here. And I figured that if I w- snuck out at night time, I wouldn't meet anybody. And that was the case. So I took my mask and, and all that kind of stuff. And I ended up going just before sunset. I could go out the back of my house and within 15 minutes, I was on the cliff tops and I could find a stone wall I could lean against and watch the sunsets. So one bit of advice is if you can just get out somewhere safely where you can watch a sunset or I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a late person. Some, some friends of mine are early, so they can they see sunrises. I, I haven't seen a sunrise since May. <laughs> so I think the best ecotherapy exercises I've discovered or worked with are the simplest ones. So what I'm suggesting with the sunset one is you just find somewhere quiet where you're not going to be disturbed, where you can just sit, get there 45, half, half an hour, maybe 20 minutes before the sunset. Um, I mean, by your sunset. So if you've got a big hill in front of you, you've got to get not according to what, what the, uh, you know, the weather forecast tells you sunset is, but you've got to get the half an hour before that sun goes behind a hill or a big building. And just, just sit. Mm. Um, I think if you're indoors, then what is immediately outside? What, what have you got in your garden? And what you can do there is you can go in close. Have you really looked at a flower? Have you really looked at the inside of a flower? And I mean, just to sit, get a chair, or sit on the ground and find a flower and spend 15 minutes exploring it. You know, its structure, its shape, its colours, its textures. What does it feel like? What does it smell like? And what you're doing there is you're, you're slowing down. You're giving your attention to one small part of the universe in real detail. And I've had people on workshops go, you know, I've never looked at the buttercup before. And what they mean is they've never really looked at a buttercup before. Um... I, you know, I think that's the kind of thing that, really, that you yeah. know people can do. Really powerful. I think I think both of them, those exercises, are really powerful, and and it's I think um, that's one of the beautiful things about ecotherapy, isn't it? It's the it's the simplicity and it's the simplicity that we forget to give to ourselves. We're so um, I think convinced in our culture that the more 
complex and complicated and i knew that something is that you you know the more powerful it will be but actually it's, it's in that stripping down you know watching a sunset spending real time with this this life that's just growing you know and and, and really paying attention to it i think is is beautiful so th- thank you for sharing both of those andy actually and you've really really inspired me actually to um, you know as you were talking about it there i was actually um looking over at a bit of basil that's growing in front of me and i thought yeah you know i'm sitting here with my laptop up all the time and and you know this, it's actually like really fascinating how it, how it grows i'm going to spend 15 minutes with that later <laughs> so you know but but it is it's, it's yeah. really powerful and i would um you know uh, you know, say that to the to the listeners as well. That you know, the, mm. the, it, it is the simplest things. Um, I've absolutely yeah. found that myself. It's the simplest things. Tuning into your senses, paying deep attention to the life that is around us, um, is, is 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 where the beauty is found. I think. Um, yeah. What 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 we're doing? You see, I think we've already. You know, what we're doing is we're giving ourselves permission to make a connection to nature. We've already got that connection. We're already the result of billions of years of life evolution. And we're just one species here. And as I say in my book, for 99% of human existence, we've been hunter-gatherers living intimately in wild nature. So what makes us think, what has changed? What has changed is the superficial, the cultural stuff. You know, if if we were to go back in time to two million years ago and meet our ancestors, they would be just like us at a fundamental level. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to kind of recognize that, that you are already in your physicality. Your body is nature. Yeah. The air that you breathe, the food that you eat, the water you drink is nature. So it's not about, wow, what is this ecotherapy? You know, how do I learn how to do ecotherapy? You just need to give yourself permission and an acknowledgement that you're already in nature. <laughs> it's, it's about raising your awareness. And you do that by slowing down, by stillness and opening your senses. And it's really that simple. That is just, I, I think, uh, you know, even though we were saying before, you know, the, there is no solid, there's no definition, but I think that that's a really beautiful, that is a beautiful nutshell that you've, that you've put ecotherapy into. And I, I know it's not the, by any stretch, the entire story, but I think that, you know, as we're slowly coming up to the end of our interview, um, that feels like such a, um, you know, such so, so, such a lovely way to and uh, to to end and to you know remind people that you know we we are nature and our bodies are nature and and everything comes from nature. It doesn't come. From, you know, we like to think that everything comes from us, but you know, um, yeah. we're just we're, we're, we're just a piece of the jigsaw. So, where um, Andy can people um, find you online if people want to you know find out more about about the book um, or just get you know just just uh, connect with you online Where, where's the best place for people to do that i'm not very good at this i'm, I'm really sorry don't worry um, i'm not either you know so <laughs> i you know you, you give me a choice do i want to sit in front of a screen or go for a walk along the cliffs it's it's yeah. a no-brainer it's a no-brainer so I, I kind of resist that um i don't think my website works i've not kept it up to date and it's mainly because I haven't been running any workshops. Um, how, about do Facebook, have, how about Facebook or social media? Yeah, yeah, I've got a page. I've got an ecotherapy page on Facebook. Mm, great. So I've got, a, I've got a photography page, which is mostly about wildlife, and I've got an ecotherapy page. Mm. Um, I, I kind of tried all these things, like tweet, Twitter and facebook and so on and blogs and i couldn't i couldn't keep it up i'm afraid i don't blame i don't blame you andy i i, I totally understand um I, the superiority of the cliffs cliffs over twitter so <laughs> it's uh, you know it's it's really it, it's uh, it makes a lot of sense to me so uh, what i could do is um i will post a link to uh, your facebook pages in the on on the blog post so if uh, wherever you're listening to the podcasts here if you head to 
uh, my website at naturetherapyonline.net and go to the blog sec section, um, you will be able to find Andy's uh, Facebook uh, links there. So that, that's how yeah. we get around that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, Andy, I'll kind of... Andy's on clips and that, that is a far better place to be. So I also, maybe this should come with a public health warning. I use Facebook in a very specific sense in general terms, and that is to plug into the politics of what's going on in the world. Mm, mm. And so I, that's why I have a separate ecotherapy page and a separate photography page. That's My main true. stuff is not to use it to, well, tell people about my personal life. Mm, mm. That isn't a place I want to share on Facebook. Mm. But it is a my what I've. It's kind of evolved, really, the stuff on Facebook. But it but it's evolved as a me, me as a way of connecting to the current modern day politics and and the kind of solutions. But it, it, makes, it, makes, it makes sense, you know, and I think there's a growing number of people who do, you know, you, you see the benefits in using using the tool that's there without kind of getting uh, overly uh, overly involved and, you know, letting it consume yeah. them. So so that's great, Andy. And, you know, I think the important the thing is that there's uh, people can find it if they want to if they want to, you know, keep up to date with what you're up to or, or even see a nice picture of those amazing cliffs that you live near. Well, and kind of, I just want to reassure people that when I get round to running workshops, you will know about it in the sense I will start repeatedly putting stuff out on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll probably get my somebody, I'll pay somebody to tidy my website up. That's great. That's um, great. Um, is there is there anything else, Andy, that you um, wanted to share with the listeners before we round off? Um. No, other than this, something, the, the, the point that I alluded to at the end of what I was saying, and it's always been my theme to encourage other people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I wrote the book. That's why I do the workshops. Um, and just to say to anybody, just get out there and connect. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good for you and you know, can only be, be, be positive. That's wonderful. And what a lovely note to, to end on. And, and I just want to thank you very much, Andy, again, for giving your time to me and to the podcast. I've um, been really inspired actually by, by, by this conversation and um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go and, and, and watch the sunset actually. So thank you very much for that. And, and yeah, thanks again for giving us your time and uh, have a lovely evening. Yeah, thanks again, Stephen. I uh, really enjoyed talking to you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, folks, uh, thanks for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed the interview. So, um, yeah, if you want to get hold of Andy's book, With Nature in Mind, you can find that on Amazon.com or .co.uk or whichever country you're in. Um, I would really recommend it for anybody interested in becoming an ecotherapist themselves. Um, but otherwise, anyone who's interested in ecotherapy or nature therapy in general, I think, could get a lot out of this book. It's got some great great ideas in it so um so yeah i really hope you enjoyed the interview thanks a lot for tuning in and just a reminder if you um, are looking to engage with an ecotherapist yourself um and you want to work online you can get in touch with me through my website so have a look at my um different services on naturetherapyonline.net and i'd be delighted to hear from you so have a lovely week folks Take care for now and bye-bye. Visit me online at naturetherapyonline.net